Future Tense by Robert Lipsight. Gary couldn't wait for the 10th grade to start so he could strut his sentences, parade his paragraphs, renew his reputation as the top creative writer in school. At the opening assembly, he felt on edge, psyched, like a boxer before the first round bell. He leaned forward as Dr. Proctor, the principal, introduced two new staff members. He wasn't particularly interested in the new vice principal, Ms. Jones. Gary never had discipline problems. He never even had to stay after school. But his head cocked alertly as Dr. Proctor introduced the new honors English teacher, Mr. Smith. Here was the person he'd have to impress. He studied Mr. Smith. The man was hard to describe. He looked as though he'd been manufactured to fit his name. Average height, brownish hair, pale white skin, medium build, middle age. He was the sort of person you began to forget the minute you met him. Even his clothes had no particular style. They merely covered his body. Mr. Smith was just there. Gary was studying Mr. Smith so intently that he didn't hear Dr. Proctor call him up to the stage to receive an award from his last term. Jim Baggs jobbed an elbow into his rib and said, let's get up there, dude. Dr. Proctor shook Gary's hand and gave him the county medal for best composition. While Dr. Proctor was giving him, was giving Jim Baggs the county trophy for best all-around athlete, Gary glanced over his shoulder to see if Mr. Smith looked impressed. But he couldn't find the new teacher. Gary wondered if Mr. Smith was so ordinary he was invisible when no one was talking about him. On the way home, Danny Belzer, the prettiest poet in school, asked Gary, What do you think of our new Mr. Woodsworth, Wordsmith? If he was a color, he'd be beige, said Gary, as if he was a taste He'd be water. If he was a sound, he'd be a low hum. Fancy empty words, sneered Mike Chung, ace reporter on the school paper. All you've told me is that you've got nothing to tell me. Danny quickly stepped between them. What did you think of the first assignment? Describe a typical day at school? said Gary, trying to unsuccessfully to mimic Mr. Smith's bland voice. That's about as exciting as tofu. A real artist, said Danny, accepts the commonplace as a challenge. That night, hunched over his humming electric typewriter, Gary wrote a description of the typical day at school, from the viewpoint of a new teacher who was seeing everything for the first time, who took nothing for granted, he described the shredded edges of the limp flag outside the dented front door, the worn flooring where generations of kids had nervously paced outside the principal's office, the nauseatingly sweet pipe smoke seeping out of the teacher's lounge. And then, in the last line, he gave the composition that extra twist, the little kicker on which his reputation rested. He wrote, the new teacher's beady little eyes missed nothing, for they were the optical recorders of an alien creature who had come to Earth to gather information. The next morning, when Mr. Smith asked for a volunteer to read aloud, Gary was on his feet and moving towards the front of the classroom before Mike Chunk got his hat out of his hand out of his pocket. Class loved Gary's composition. They laughed and stamped their feet. Chung shrugged, which meant he couldn't think of any criticism. And Danny flashed thumbs up. Best of all, Jim Baggs shouldered Gary against the blackboard after class and said, Awesome tale, dude. Gary felt good until he got the composition back. Along one margin, in perfect script, Mr. Smith had written, you can do better. How would he know? Gary complained on the way home. You should be grateful, Danny said. He's pushing you to the farthest limits of your talent. Which may be nearer than you think, snickered Mike. Gary rewrote his composition, expanded it, complicated it, thickened it. Not only was this new teacher an alien, he was part of an extraterrestrial conspiracy to take over the earth. 
Gary's final sentence was, Every iota of information, fragment of fact, morsel of minutia sucked up by those vacuuming eyes was beamed directly into a computer circling the planet. The data would eventually become a program that would control the mind of every school kid on Earth. Gary showed the new draft to Danny before class. He stood on tiptoe so he could read over her shoulder. Sometimes he wished she were shorter, but mostly he wished he were taller. What do you think? The assignment was to describe a typical day, said Danny. This is off the wall. He snatched the paper back. Creative writing means creating, he said, walked away, hurt and angry. He thought, if she doesn't like my compositions, how can I ever get her to like me? That morning, Mike Chung read his own composition aloud to the class. He described a typical day through the eyes of a student in a wheelchair. Everything most students take for granted was an obstacle. The bathroom door was too heavy to open. The gym steps too steep to climb. The light switch too high on the wall. The class applauded and Mr. Smith nodded approvingly. Even Gary had to admit it was really good. If you considered plain fact journalism as creative writing, that is. Gary's rewrite came back the next day, marked improving. Try again. Saturday, he locked himself in his room after breakfast and rewrote the rewrite. He carefully selected his nouns and verbs and adjectives. He polished and arranged them in a sentence like a jeweler stringing pearls. He felt good as he wrote. As the electric typewriter hummed and buzzed and sometimes coughed, he thought, Every champion knows that as hard as it is to get to the top, it's even harder to stay up there. His mother knocked on the door around noon. When he let her in, she said, It's a beautiful day. Big project, he mumbled. He wanted to avoid a distracting conversation. She smiled. If you spend too much time in your room, you'll turn into a mushroom. He wasn't listening. Thanks. Anything's okay. Don't forget the mayonnaise. Gary wrote. The alien's probes trembled as he read the student's composition. Could that skinny, bespectacled earthling really suspect its extraterrestrial identity? Or was this composition merely the result of a creative thunderstorm and a brilliant young mind? Before Gary turned in his composition on Monday morning, he showed it to Mike Chung. He should have known better. You're trying too hard, chortled Chung. Truth is stronger than fiction. Gary flinched at that. It hurt. It might be true, but he couldn't let his competition know he had scored. You journalists are stuck in the present and the past, growled Gary. Imagination prepares us for what's going to happen. Danny read her composition aloud to the class. It described a typical day from the perspective of a louse. Choosing a head of hair to nest in, the louse moved from the thickest of the varsity crew cut to the matted jungle of a sagging perm to a straight, sleek, blonde cascade. Class cheered and Mr. Smith smiled. Gary felt a twinge of jealousy. Danny and Mike were coming on. There wasn't room for more than one at the top. In the hallway, he said to Danny, And you called my composition off the wall? Mike jumped in. There's a big difference between poetical metaphor and hack science fiction. Gary felt choked by a lump in his throat. He hurried away. Mr. Smith handed back Gary's composition the next day, marked, See me after school. Gary was nervous all day. What was there to talk about? Maybe Mr. Smith hated science fiction. One of these traditional English teachers didn't understand that science fiction could be literature. Maybe I can educate him, thought Gary. When Gary arrived at the English office, Mr. Smith seemed nervous too. He kept folding and unfolding Gary's composition. Where do you get such ideas? He asked in his monotone voice. Gary shrugged. It just come over me. Alien teachers taking over the minds of school children? Mr. Smith's empty eyes were blinking. What made you think of that? I've always had this vivid imagination. If you're sure it's just your imagination, 
Mr. Smith looked relieved. I guess everything will work out. He handed back Gary's composition. No more fantasy, Gary. Reality. That's your assignment. Write only about what you know. Outside school, Gary ran into Jim Baggs, who looked surprised to see him. Don't tell me you had to stay after, dude. I had to see Mr. Smith about my composition. He didn't like it. He told me to stick to reality. Don't listen, Jim Baggs body checked Gary into the schoolyard fence. Dude, you gotta be yourself. Gary ran all the way home and locked himself in his room. He felt feverish with creativity. Dude, you gotta be yourself, dude. It doesn't matter what your so-called friends say or your English teacher. You gotta play your own kind of game, write your own kind of stories. The words flowed out of Gary's mind and through his fingers and out of the machine onto the sheets of paper, and he wrote and rewrote until he felt the words were exactly right. With great effort, the alien shut down the electrical panic impulses coursing through its system and turned on logical overdrive. There were two possibilities. One, this high school boy was exactly what he seemed to be, a brilliant imaginative apprentice, best-selling author and screenwriter, or two, he had somehow stumbled onto the secret plan. And he would have to be either enlisted into the conspiracy or erased off the face of the planet. First thing in the morning, Gary turned in his new rewrite to Mr. Smith. Half an hour later, Mr. Smith called out, called Gary out of Spanish. There was no expression on his regular features. He said, I'm going to need some help with you. Cold sweat covered Gary's body as Mr. Smith grabbed his arm and led him to the new vice principal. She read the composition, and while they waited, Gary got a good look at her for the first time. Mrs. Jones was just there. She looked as though she'd been manufactured to fit her name. Average, standard, typical. Cold sweat turned into goose pimples. How could I have missed these clues? Smith and Jones were aliens. He stumbled onto their secret, and now they'd have to deal with him. He blurted out, are you going to enlist me or erase me? Mrs. Jones ignored him. My opinion, Mr. Smith, you are overreacting. This sort of nonsense, she waved Gary's composition, is the typical response of an overstimulated adolescent in the mixture of reality and fantasy in an environment dominated by manipulative music, television, and films. Nothing for us to worry about. You're sure, Mrs. Jones, said Mr. Smith. He didn't sound sure. The vice principal looked at Gary for the first time. There was no expression in her eyes. Her voice was flat. You better get off this uh, science fiction kick, she said, if you know what's good for you. I'll never tell another human being, I swear, he babbled. What are you talking about? asked Mrs. Jones. Your secret is safe with me, he lied. He thought if I can just get away from them, alert the authorities, save the planet. You see, said Mrs. Jones, you're riding yourself into a crazed state. You're beginning to believe your own fantasies, said Mr. Smith. I'm not going to do anything this time, said Mrs. Jones, but you must promise to write only about what you know, or I'll have to fail you, said Mr. Smith. For your own good, said Mrs. Jones. Writing can be very dangerous, especially for writers, said Mr. Smith, who write about things they shouldn't. Absolutely, said Gary, positively, no question about it, only what I know. He backed out the door, nodding his head, thinking just a few more steps and I'm okay. Hope these aliens can't read minds. Jim Baggs was practicing head fakes in the hallway. He slammed Gary into the wall with a hip block. How's it going, dude? He asked, helping Gary up. Aliens, Gary guessed. Told me no more science fiction. You can't treat a star writer like that, said Jim. See what the head honcho's got to say. He grabbed Gary's wrist and dragged him to the principal's office. What can I do for you boys? Boomed Dr. Proctor. They're messing with his moves, Doc said Jim Baggs. You gotta let them, you gotta let the aces run their course. Thank you, James. Dr. 
Proctor popped his forefinger at the door. I'll handle this. You're home free, dude, said Jim, whacking Gary across the shoulder blades as he left. From the beginning, ordered Dr. Proctor. He nodded sympathetically as Gary told the entire story from the opening assembly to the meeting with Mr. Smith and Mrs. Jones. When Gary finished, Dr. Proctor took the paper from Gary's hand. He shook his head as he read Gary's latest rewrite. You really have a way with words, Gary. I should have sensed you were on to something. Gary's stomach flipped. You really think there could be aliens trying to take over the Earth? Certainly, said Dr. Proctor matter-of-factly. Earth is the ripest plum in the universe. Gary wasn't sure if he should feel relieved that he wasn't crazy or be scared out of his mind. He took a deep breath to control the quaver of his voice as he said, I spotted Smith and Jones right away. They looked like they were manufactured to fit their names. Obviously humanoids. Panicked as soon as they knew I was onto them. Dr. Proctor chuckled and shook his head. No self-respecting civilization would send those two stiffs to Earth. They're not aliens? He felt relieved and disappointed at the same time. I'll check them out myself, said Dr. Proctor. Just two average, standard, typical human beings with no imagination and no creativity. So why'd you hire them? Dr. Proctor laughed. Because they'd never spot an alien. No creative imagination. That's why I got rid of the last vice principal and the last honors English teacher. They were giving me odd little glances when they thought I wasn't looking. After 10 years on your planet, I've learned to smell trouble. Gary's spine turned to ice and dripped down the backs of his legs. You're an alien? Great composition, said Dr. Proctor, waving Gary's paper. Grammatical, vividly written, totally accurate. It's just a composition, babbled Gary. Made the whole thing up. Imagination, you know. Dr. Proctor removed the face of his wristwatch and began tapping tiny buttons. I always liked writers. I majored in your planet's literature. Writers are the keepers of the past and the hope for the future. Too bad they cost so much trouble in the present. I won't tell anyone, cried Gary. Your secret's safe with me began to back slowly towards the door. Dr. Proctor shook his head. How can writers keep secrets, Gary? It's in their nature to share their creations with the world. He tapped three times and froze Gary in place, one foot raised to step out the door. But it was only a composition, screamed Gary as his body disappeared before his eyes. I can't wait to hear what the folks back home say when I read it to them, said Dr. Proctor. Made it all up! Gary had the sensation of rocketing upward. I made up the whole...